Welcome to the 36th California Small Farm Conference. My name is Guido Lois, and I'm a Communications and Events Manager with CAF, which stands for Community Alliance with Family Farmers. Today, we have an amazing workshop with Saul Alba, but before I let him speak, I just wanted to mention a few logistical details. First of all, this webinar is, is being recorded. Just so you know, we're going to show the recording after the conference is done. And if you want to have your questions answered, we do request that you put them utilizing the Q&A feature. The, we're trying to use the chat for comments only. So if you put your questions there, most likely we're not going to read them. But if you put them in the Q&A, we definitely will. Uh, and if there's no time, we can follow up after. There's not going to be an issue. The Q&A button should be in the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see it, just click under more where you see those three little dots on the bottom right of your Zoom screen. And yeah, you can just ask your questions there and we'll make sure that Saul gets to see them. Uh, other than that, I just wanted to thank our sponsors for making this possible. And to all of you for attending and to Saul Alba for making this happen with us. So Saul, it's all yours from now on. Awesome. Uh Thanks a lot, Guido. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see that, Guido? Yeah, I can see it. OK, very well. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about biological control of outdoor crops. Uh, my name is Saul Alba in Spanish, or Saul Alba in English. I go. I answered either one, and I'm an IPM specialist for beneficial insectary. We are uh, producers of uh, predatory organisms uh, for uh, crop protection uh, located in Redding, California. I'm actually in Salinas. I'm the local representative. Um, so I'm um, going to talk to you about biological control of outdoor crops. Uh, whoops. Did it flip over there, Guido? I was having trouble with it earlier. Did it flip to the second uh, slide? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, let me know if it, for some reason it pauses. I was having issues earlier. Um, but yeah, um, so first off is uh, the definition. We should, we should just go over the definition of biological control. Biological control is a component of an integrated pest management strategy. It's defined as a reduction of pest populations by natural enemies and typically involves an active human role. So pest predators are commonly known by a few different names. Um, beneficials uh, is one that's pretty common. They're also known as natural enemies and also known as biocontrol agents. That's the one I prefer to use. So when you hear me say BCAs, I'm referring to uh, beneficial uh, organisms. So first off, I wanted to go over, I'm sure a lot of you already know about the two branches of biological control. It's interesting that it's it's inter it's important that we understand uh, what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, first, there's conservation biological control, and then there's augmentative biological control, and uh, these are uh, def definitions from the Center for Agriculture and Bioscience International. So, conservation biocontrol is uh, their farming practices that aim to increase the abundance of natural enemies already in the environment. For instance, improving the environmental conditions helps natural enemies and pathogens to thrive. So it's these practices that you're doing on the farm. Um, in augmentative biocontrol, the, grower, the growers are increasing the natural enemies and pathogens in an area on a timely basis to fight pests and diseases. Natural, natural enemies and pathogens are, for example, predators, parasitoids, or microbes. You can see conservation biocontrol in the top photo. That's, uh, you know, we'll be talking about these these plantings and then um, augmentated biocontrol is the two, two guys on the bottom releasing predators into the crop. So I'm going to start with uh, conservation biological control and probably spend most of my time on that. Um, 
So another way to think about conservation biocontrol is to uh, think of it uh, in terms of farmscaping, okay? Uh, farmscaping would be um, an ecologically based whole farm approach to enhancing the efficacy and local abundance of natural enemies through the applications of the environment. Okay, how is that? Well, farmscaping can enhance natural enemy populations by providing shelter, nectar, alternative prey, and pollen, known as the acronym SNAP, which is a good one to memorize uh, because essentially that's how, those are the strategies for farmscaping. Um, diving in a little bit deeper, I'm going to be dealing primarily with um, the, uh, the, the shelter, nectar, and pollen. Um, we can go into the alternative prey if, if you really want, um, but that, that would be at the end. Um, but I'm going to talk here about insect plants and trap crops, I'm sure. A lot of you have heard about these already. I'm just going to go, you know, from the elementary level and, you know, discuss them in detail. Okay. So there's insectary plants and trap crops that are used in farmscaping. Okay. Insectary, insectary plants are used in biological control conservation to provide floral and or extra floral nectar and pollen to parasitoids and predators. So they're providing food, supplementary food for the predators um, and, and attracting them to the crop. Uh, Trap crops are plant stands deployed to attract, divert, intercept, and or retain targeted insects or the pathogen say vector in order to reduce damage in the main crop. So insectary plants are used to attract natural enemies to the money crop. Trap crop, crop resources are used to distract pests from the money crop. All right, there's an important question here. Um, can a plant be both an insectary and a trap? Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of sweet alyssum, probably are using it on your farms. This is, this is the uh, species I'll be focusing on for this question. So sweet alyssum is a brassica that's commonly used um, as an insectary plant to provide nectar and pollen resources for a number of biocontrol agents. But there's also the possibility that alyssum can become a BCA trap crop. Okay, so what I mean by that is the BCA sticking around on what's supposed to be just a resource. Um, now, could this could the amount of alyssum planted in the field impact the role this companion plant will have? So there is a possibility that alyssum can serve as a pest trap crop also, if planted, you know, as a companion in brassica fields. But can it serve as a pest insectary by providing pests with resources like food and shelter? Again, the same question, could the amount of sweet alyssum in the field impact the role that the companion plant is playing? So can my companion plant become a pest insectary plant and or a BCA trap crop? What I'm leading to in this question is, uh, will the companion plant provide resources for a pest to thrive and move into the money crop? That'd be bad. And or provide resources that distract a biocontrol aging agent from searching for pests in the money crop? That would be bad, right? So I believe the answer might be in the way that it's used. And I'm gonna go over the kind of the two systems that I have seen. This is the most common uh, system where uh, sweet alyssum is planted in strips in a field. So these are leafy greens. Um, likely the reason farmers like this uh, way the strip system is because it's easy to plant it's easy to control their weediness because they can get weedy and um, it's also easy to irrigate so, uh, the strips can also be planted in the perimeter of the crop which would allow the farmer to 
avoid them if the field needs to be disc and replanted during the same growing season. Strips are planted uniformly in the crop. That means significant cost of seeds and the amount that is plant planted could potentially create a pest insectary plant and or a BCA trap crop. And then there's this other less common way of doing it, um, which are which I call islands. Um, so they're not very common, like I said. Um, weediness is not as easy to control. That's what a lot of farmers fear. Um, and if the crop is disc during the season, then you know you've destroyed uh, your uh, your your companion plant. Um, islands can be planted uniformly throughout the crop and. In small patches like these, small stands like these, that would mean lower cost of seed, potentially less likelihood to create either a pest insectary plant and or a BCA trap crop. So then just some questions to ask if you're gonna be uh, diving into these, uh, these methods. Um, First, is there a well-researched companion plant that works with your crop? It's best to learn from the experiences, you know, both positive and negative of farmers that um, have used them in the crop that you're farming. Um, does the plant provide an olfactory substance that is attractive to the target organism? So some plants uh, provide resources that a BCA finds attractive and some that a pest finds attractive and some that attract both. And a very key one is, um, is the nectar or pollen accessible to the organism that you are attempting to attract? A lot of biocontrol agents are tiny. Um, and if the resources are, you know, not accessible with their tiny mouth parts, then it's not gonna serve, it's not gonna serve you as an insectary. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over some of the concepts and, and strategies for uh, insectary plants and trap crops. I'm sure you've all heard a lot of a lot of these, but I'll give some cool examples. Oops. One question is um, using a single species or using multiple species. Um, there are advantages, I believe, and disadvantages, um, and I'm just gonna go over them. So single species versus multiple species. A tried and true single species delivers consistency. A single species is easier to plant and maintain, but multiple species might attract a wider variety of organisms and multiple species can provide a longer continuous bloom through the crop cycle. Then we have to ask about season long uh, versus sequential planting. So season long plantings would be uh, the stands that are planted just before or at the same time as the crop. And the sequential plantings are planted well before or after the, the uh, crops, the actual money crops been planted, right? So they will be providing their resources at strategic times. Sequential plantings, okay, attracting the organism prior to the crop presence to either destroy it before it can harm the crop, that'd be like a trap plant, or to have a healthy presence of natural enemies waiting for the crop pest, that would be like an insectary uh, plant, right? Planting later, the reason you would do that is, uh, th that means later than um, you first plant your your crop. Um, in other words, you have a crop established. Maybe perhaps the early stages of compa companion plantings can be more attractive than later stages. Or planting earlier. Perhaps it's the late stages of the companion planting that can be more attractive than the early stages. So one example would be uh, if you planted something uh, that a trap crop, for example, uh, that the whole idea is for it to senesce at the right time when there's the highest pest pressure. The senescence often, you know, weakening of plants as they're senescing often 
um, will make them more attractive to pests. Okay, um, this is an interesting uh, concept, which is the dead end trap crop. Basically, it's a trap crop that where if the pest arrives, something basically there's a dead end there. The, the pest cannot move into the crop. So it's really functional because it's sort of serving as like a, a, a magnet for the pest. And there's different ways that you can actually make it work for you. So for example, a trap crop can be destined for destruction along with the pest. Once you have enough pests um, on it, you can actually mow it down or, you know, or burn it or whatever. Um, but you can also use it to eradicate a pest, but the plant be left unharmed. So, so for example, if you have a trap crop that's more attractive to a pest and you, for example, applied biological control to it or sprayed it, or even in the case of, um, like for example, corn, I've heard of um, BT corn being planted in the perimeter of of a of a you know of another of a corn that's not BT. So when moths arrive um, and lay their eggs, they lay on that corn variety that that has the 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 BT toxin in it, and uh, the larvae don't get don't get to develop. And, um, and then therefore infest the money crop. And then there's also uh, the trap crop where the pest life cycle is broken. And a very common one is where the adults are attracted to it and the females will lay eggs in it, but the larva cannot live on it. Um, so if, if the trap crop is more attractive than the money crop, you have ways of essentially stopping and eradicating um, the pest when it shows up. So here's a cool system I got to work with. Um, what you see here is a field uh, of uh, strawberries. It wasn't planted when I when I took the Google Maps photo, um, but you see uh, uh, this yellow area on the left side there. Um, that that's an area where we had some, I think some just some wild mustard. And then there's a riparian area surrounding all of it. And then the red, orange, and green stripes are perimeter plants that we planted. It was the same uh, trap crop. The red plants were, the red line was uh, the plantings that occurred just before the crop was put in. The orange ones uh, is the same crop, uh, same trap crop, but uh, planted several weeks after and the green one also several weeks after the orange one. And the idea here is that there was an attract, there was a point where um, that trap crop was more attractive to the pest, and that was when it was flowering. Um, so you'd have this sequential flowering where, you know, the red area, the red planting flowered first, followed by the orange planting and then the green planting. And what you could do is, uh, you know, once the red, uh, the red strip was infested. You can go in there with your flail and just mow it down um, at the appropriate time. Obviously, you want to get them when they're nymph. They were nymphs uh, where they couldn't fly into the money crop. And then a few weeks later, you'd have the same situation with the orange um, with the orange strip. And then finally, you'd have one that situation in the green. So it's kind of a a, a dead end. Uh, it's kind of like a combination of um, all of, a lot of these concepts. Um, it would be a sequential planting and a dead end trap crop. Then there's this pretty famous system, the push pull system. I'm sure you've uh, you've all heard of it, or if you haven't, I'm going to explain it here. But basically, it's a combination of attractive plants, usually planted around the perimeter of the crop and a deterrent crop usually intracropped with the money crop. So here's how it works. This is from some work that was done on corn um, to essentially push pull on a stem borer. Um, so this napier grass was very attracted to the stem borer's adults. 
and this low-lying desmodium uh, was repellent. So again, the, the grass was planted on the perimeter of the crop. So you're pulling the pest, the adult pest out of the crop. It lays its eggs there. Um, then you can do what you want with that crop. But then you also have the help of the desmodium, which is planted within the crop. Um, and that's actually repelling the adults. It's it's kind of neat. It's a, it's a pest attractant working along with a pest deterrent, ultimately leading to pulling the pest away from the money crop. All right, I'm going to go into augmentative biocontrol. Again, uh, remember this is where the farmer is actually putting biocontrol agents out in their field, right? I talked about how the conservation biocontrol branch is the one that can help you bring the biocontrol agents into the money crop. The augmentative biocontrol would be the inoculation by the farmer. They should not be considered mutually exclusive. Conservation biocontrol can help augmentative biocontrol because the resources you're providing with, for example, insect uh, plants might keep the, be the biocontrol agents that you have released into your field. You get what I'm saying? So there are a number of different commercially available, bi available biological control agents. Um, I'm just gonna talk about a few of them that I am more familiar with in outdoor crops. Um, there are, you know, a, a whole, you know, compendium of these um, different, uh, different BCAs, but uh, I'm gonna focus on some of the ones that help manage common pests in, um, in outdoor crops. So first I wanna call, um, I wanna talk about what we call the generalist predators. So a generalist BCA doesn't target just one species of a pest. So here's a couple of examples. Um, Aureus insidiosus is uh, a predatory bug, um, also known as the minute pirate bug. It's often used for thrips control, but it also preys on aphids, spider mites, and most other small pests that it can overpower. Um, the photo on the left there is pretty cool. One of my uh, customers really loves releasing aureus in their crop, and they they go with massive inundative rates. And they got that photo of two uh, aureus bugs fighting over a thrips. Another cool thing about them is if they multiply in your crops, which they will, if they will often reproduce in your crops, you get uh, you get the, the nymph, which is on the right there. Um, and they are also predatory. The other generalists was the lacewing, the green lacewing larva, um, also known as the aphid lion. It's often used for aphid control, but also preys on thrips, spider, spider mites, and most other small pests that it can overpower. And it's amazing what both aureus and lacewing can overpower. I've seen them uh, basically attempting to feed on caterpillars that are several times larger than they are. All right, now more more of what what we call the specialist predators, and um, you know, to a degree or another, they're more specialized for a specific target, right? So some aphid biocontrol agents. Many of you have heard of uh, parasitoid wasps. These are teeny tiny little wasps that. Um, are about the size of an ant, and they um, they'll inject their eggs into a living aphid. The larva will hatch from the egg, and begin to essentially eat the innards of that aphid, developing as you know as it's eaten away, and uh, eventually killing the aphid, and then finally emerging from the dead aphid, like you see there um, on the photo on the right. So these are, they are just aphid uh, parasitoids. They, they don't target any other pests. So it's 
it's the definition of a specialist BCA. Um, if you don't have aphids, they won't have anywhere to, to uh, lay their eggs. There are also predatory midges. Uh, a midge is a fly. Uh, they're related to mosquitoes. Um, there are a few different ones that are used in augmentative biocontrol. The one here is um, Aphidolides Um And it's actually the larvae that are predatory. So the, the adult fly will lay its eggs near aphid colonies and um, the little maggot that you see there on the right photo, the little orange worm, um, will feed, like literally just attack and feed on the aphids. Um, my understanding, it's not completely specialized on, by, on aphids, that they do feed on other pests. Of those, I'm not sure um, which ones and not positive that they are recommended for control. But for aphids, they can work really well. So spider mites are a um, spider mites are you know, geez, they feed on practically every crop I can think of. Um, so they're very common out in a uh, common pest out in outdoor crops and in greenhouses. Um, particularly the two spotted spider mite. So two spotted spider mite does have um, we do uh, rear predatory mites uh, for them. Um, they're from the uh, what's called the phy phytoseid family. Um, on the left, you see examples of either Amblyseus or Neoseilus uh, species. And then on the right is a pretty famous one, um, Phytoseilus persimilis, which is a true specialist of two spotted spider mites. So the thrips biocontrol agents also, you know, somewhat generalist. Some of them are generalist. Some of them are very specific uh, for management of thrips. Um, the uh, there's there are also Amblyseus and Neoseilus species in uh, in these uh, thrips biocontrol uh, predatory mites. Um, they're hard to tell apart the different species, but uh, two very common ones are um, Amblyseus swirsky and um, Amblyseus cucumeris. Um, cucumeris is uh, they're not they're not a hundred percent specialist because they will feed on um, other mites. Um, and by the way, many of these mites can also supplementary feed, survive, and reproduce on pollen. A little bit on caterpillar specialists. Um, there are parasitoid wasps that will only target um, moth eggs. Uh, that's all that. That's how they go through their reproductive cycle. And then there are parasitic nematodes. Um, if you run into, um, they're useful if you run into caterpillar species that spend some time um, in the soil. Mealybugs are also a common pest. Um, mainly you'll find specialists of mealybugs. Like I mentioned um, earlier, lacewing and aureus will feed on a lot of these. And actually, lacewing is used in the management of mealybugs in orchards. Uh, but you also, you, you have um, parasitoid wasps that are, that are specifically targeting um, uh, one of the life stages of of a mealybug. And then there's the predatory beetle, um, Cryptolamus, which is on the right there. It's also known as the mealybug destroyer. And um, the larva is, uh, looks like a mealybug. And I've heard told that it's kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing type of situation. So a little bit on delivery methods. Um, I'm just going to go over some of the more commonly practiced ones. I I work with uh, with drones quite a bit. Um, 
this is uh should be a video i don't know why it's not playing there it goes they can fly they can do about a, an, an acre a minute um although they normally don't like to fly them that fast but um this is what the delivery device of the company i work with looks like it's a are they're clear tubes with holes in them and as you can see they're dropping carrier and biological biologicals onto the crop so um really neat system because it uh it's not only delivering them but it's keeping the biocontrol agent mixed and uniform in the um in the carrier and a lot of work has been done to um evaluate the efficacy of i'm sorry the safety of this method onto um, on the um, biocontrol agents and it's pretty good it's a very gentle way to to deliver them And then this is a new device that we are currently working on. Um, it's basically a tractor mounted uh, device. So we're looking at a number of vehicles that you can mount it on, but um, you can see behind the driver, there's a, um, there's a box there with a yellow lid. That's a hopper where the natural enemy and carrier is placed. And then through the use of some fans and the motor, you can actually um, literally quote unquote, spray the biocontrol agent onto, in this case, strawberries, three miles per hour. So you can imagine six, six beds at three miles per hour, obviously slower than the drone, but still, still gets the job done. And it's pretty specifically drops a uniform quantity on each bed. And then what you're all more familiar with would be the old school manual a little bit more labor intensive. So they've got a whole crew out here distributing the uh, natural enemies. But uh, you can imagine that takes a while and there's issues with uniformity, right? Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with these blower apparatus that you see there on the right, but basically it's just a leaf blower with a hopper attached to it. Hopper gets filled with the product dial in the uh, quantity you want release um, with that that uh, valve that you see there and you're blowing the you blow the products um, onto the crop and they're pretty safe if you design them correctly um, they're great for covering large areas my understanding is there was a study done in strawberry where they compared labor and materials between spraying a miticide and applying biocontrol uh predatory mites using the blower and cost came out about the same oops so this is just a list of some of the products uh most of these are used in one crop system or another um, if anyone has interest in learning more about them you can visit our website our motto, biocontrol works best in a preventative fashion. So whether it's augmentative or or uh, conservation, you kind of want to get ahead of, of, uh, of the pest population. It's very difficult to cure a problem with biocontrol. It's, it's best to, um, to use it preventatively. So on YouTube, we do have a, um, a, a channel. Um, and if you click on the videos, you'll find um, pretty much all of our products will be instructional videos for how to properly use them. But your uh, your IPM specialist, which is probably me because I have the most California, can help you um, and train you and make sure that you're, that you're using them properly. Uh, but you can go ahead and check that out. Um, photo credits. And that's it. That's my email there. And um, feel free to reach out. Looks like we have one question. So what are the research gaps, knowledge needs for biological pest management? There are there are a few, especially in outdoor crops. Um, there are there's a couple of systems where um, 
biological control that has been used now for decades, specifically strawberry uh, strawberries for uh, two spotted spider mite. Spider mite that's been researched quite a bit, um, and uh, you know there are uh, there's enough success stories uh, that you know you you have the actually protocols of what to do. But some of these these other outdoor crops they're they're much newer, so they're, they're a little bit more limited in um, research, um, especially when it comes to the new application methods like drones. Um, we still need to really hone in on um, what the uh, what the appropriate rate to use, also the frequency of release, um, and then um, you know whether whether it should be a continuous release through the growing season, through the you know through what part of the season. So there's a lot of work left to be done, and that's primarily because a lot of this new technology that helps deliver. Um, product in crops where it wasn't normally easy or way too labor intensive to, to deliver them. Um, they're now, they're now looking at biological control for a number of reasons, but one of them is, is because, you know, the drone work, for example, essentially eliminates a lot of, of labor costs. So, um, so they're, so they're new crops for us and we're still learning. Hope that was uh, an, a good answer. Okay, are there books or other resources you'd recommend for learning more about insect IPM? For example, pairing insect and plant species for trap crops, insectary plants, et cetera. Yeah, there's a, there are a lot of resources. Um, I mainly, um, if, you want, if you go on the, um, I believe it's a UCANR website, there are books on, on biological control and the, you know, the commercially available insects. And there's a number of books out there. Um, if you just top, you know, if you just look for conservation biocontrol or um, or farmscaping, there's a lot of a lot of resources out there. And if you're if you're really interested, go ahead and take down my email and reach out. I can send you a bunch of literature that is more specific to your crop and your pests, because um, this stuff's really fun for me, and I've got a a lot of uh, studies that were. Um, conducted you know for many years now and I um, downloaded a bunch of of the, that literature is biological pest management possible for small scale absolutely um it's it, greenhouse production is where biological control really got started in earnest um and those crops are you know usually smaller um very very tiny farms, absolutely. Conservation bio biocontrol can be you know can be done on in your backyard, you know for for you know some of your I don't know pepper plants or whatever you may have. Um, and yeah, releasing uh, biocontrol agents um, augmentatively, you know, is is also an option. Um, one of the hurdles is. Um, that even usually a very tiny farm, even the smallest products that are sold are way more than the farmer needs. Um, that's not so bad, but um, the shipping costs sometimes will will be more than, uh, than the product itself because we have to ship these things overnight on ice. And so, you know, the ice packs are heavy. Um, so shipping costs are kind of prohibitive, but we're coming up with ways to address that. Um, we've got, uh, we will have soon um, a service that's kind of like, uh, it's it's a delivery service that'll go from our uh, packing uh, location and up, the, which is one of them is down in, um, Santa Barbara County, and uh, hopefully weekly be able to deliver these uh, bugs up the coast, all the way up to Watsonville, or um, you know, and basically eliminate the shipping costs for the grower. So small growers could coordinate with this these deliveries and show up and pick up their their product, and then therefore just and you know that's how you can eliminate the uh, the shipping costs. Which crops use BCAs most often in California? Are you seeing an increase in use? 
Yes, we are absolutely seeing an increase in use. Our company has grown quite a bit. I was, I think we've doubled our our uh, sales, technical sales team uh, since I came on board five years ago. Um, you know, there's plenty of reasons for it. One, um, organic farming limits what materials you can use to control pests. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of farmers that are going organic, that are growing organic crops will, um, you know, they'll, they'll use the augmentative approach. Um, and then which crops use the most, the BCAs most often? Well, I already mentioned strawberries. That's a huge success story. Um, and greenhouse crops really are the ones where we have the most experience and the most years working with them. Uh, so both food and ornamental crops, uh, you know, they'll use, uh, they'll use biocontrol. Any thoughts on how these methods may translate into an urban farm setting? Are there any added risk factors, et cetera? So we are currently working with a number of urban farms. Um, I happen to have, I don't know if you would call it an urban farm, but um, a company, a customer of mine is, uh, what they do is they, they, uh, they they sell the service for maintaining, well, actually setting up and maintaining living walls, which are those, you know, kind of uh, interior scape features you see in certain office buildings, you know, just kind of to beautify the place. And in those, those types of settings, you can't really use pesticides. So um, they opt for a heavy use of biocontrol in in that type of setting that's one of the nice you know, things about um the urban environment is you do have to be real careful of what materials you might be spraying sort of pushes you to stay away from the harsh materials and pushes you towards biological control but yeah there's currently lots of lots of work in uh in uh, urban urban type settings That's what I have for you. Um, any other questions? Did I miss anything? Oh, here we go. Um, is bio, if biological control is best as a preventative measure rather than a cure to a pest problem, how does one spray or otherwise deal with a pest without wiping out beneficials? I imagine it depends on the situation, but I'm curious to know what kinds of strategies are being used. Uh, there are strategies for incorporating sprays. Um, sometimes those involve um, compatible sprays. And actually my company does sell certain products that are compatible with lots of biocontrol agents. Um, there, 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 is, there is risk of even the compatible uh, materials hurting your biocontrol program. Uh, and that's why you gotta you have to work with uh, with with an IPM specialist like myself who can kind of guide you to on how to how to incorporate both sprays and biocontrol. Uh, many growers are very successful with it. Um, one other option too is, is timing um, when you when you use a spray. A lot of people don't realize it, but organic sprays um, uh, they they're actually organic farmers actually spray more than um, conventional farmers in many crop settings and that's because their materials are are not toxins they're they 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 use other methods to to kill the pest so you never get the re the same kill from um a lot of organic materials i'm not going to say never but you don't get as you know as reliably reliably as if you use the toxin um so you have to spray more frequently um, some growers opt to release the day after a spray so that they have the longest time for their biological control agent to work before they spray again. And just like they don't, these sprays don't fully eradicate a pest, it's rare that they fully eradicate a biocontrol agent. But sprays can be harmful, especially if you're trying to establish them in your crop. And Moet's question is uh, basically, I think I answered it there. Um, there are 
there are lots of strategies for it, but it really depends on, geez, a number, a lot, a lot, a lot of things like which crop you're working with, which biocontrol agent you're working with, um, what pests you're spraying for. All right. Um, there are some that are, there are some BCAs that are super resistant. In particular, um, lacewing larvae are surprisingly resistant to a lot of materials. Um, so they can be used, um, you know, I don't know, many of you are probably familiar with pyrethrins. My understanding from the literature I've read, um, pyrethrins are not terribly destructive to lacewing larvae. And lacewing larvae are generalists. So, so what you got is uh, a predator that feeds on a number of different pests that isn't impacted by unorganic material like a pyrethrin, which is effective against um, a number of different insect pests. Anyone else have uh, anything else? All right, Guido, I think, uh, oh, there's another question or chat. Oh, you're welcome. You know how to reach me. Um, I love talking about this stuff. Um, you know, just reach out, email's best. And uh, I travel all over the state. So if you need a visit, give a holler. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. I think I, I'm sharing. Oh, sorry about that. I'm just going to share one video and we're going to wrap this up a little early, but I'm glad that you all got to participate, ask your questions. Thank you so much for putting them in the Q&A. That actually makes it so much easier for us. And we still have more workshops, a full day tomorrow. And we join gatherings coming on Thursday and Friday. So we hope to see many of you there. And to Saul, thank you again so much for doing this. It was, it was You're great. welcome. Yeah. Anytime. Really yeah. I've um, I've got it half translated in Spanish too. So if you need that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, tomorrow for the attendees, we have a full day of workshops in Spanish. So feel free to join those as well. Uh, and yeah, maybe in the future we can do the same thing in Spanish. So that'll be great. You got it. Awesome. All right. Okay. See you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you with more workshops. Thanks, Paul.